Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of Recovering the Sacred. I'm uh, James Duke Barbieri, Program Coordinator at Pari Center and host for you for this series. As, I'm host, as a host, I'm here to help you. So um, any issues, technical or not, feel free to let me know in the chat. Um, just a uh, quick reminder to make sure your microphone is muted um, and that the um, chat is open, so feel free to uh, share any comments or material or thoughts with the rest of the group. Um, and that this session is recorded for archive purposes and for you all, and that you should receive the uh, link to the recording in a few days. Uh, so today we have the honor to be joined by Peter Reason, who will talk to us about the sacred as imminent in a, in a sentient world. Uh, Peter is Emeritus Professor and Director of the Centre for Action Research and Professional Practice at the University of Bath in England. In this position, he was an international leader in the development of participative approaches to action research. In these forms of experiential inquiry are all co-researchers, contributing both to the thinking that forms the research and to the action that is its subject. His publications include Spindrift, A Wilderness Pilgrimage at Sea, in Search of Grace, An Ecological Pilgrimage, and most recently with artist Sarah Gillsby on Presence, Essays and Drawings, and On Sentience, Essays and Drawings. Before that, as always, uh, let's take a uh, quiet moment of reflection before we pass it over to Peter uh, to engage with the sacred. Uh, to assist us, we will have Joseph Noel, a young musician from Siena again, to play us the opening aria to Bach's Goldberg Variations. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Peter. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. I want to start by acknowledging the more than human world and the land into which we're all deeply integrated and the many beings, both human and other than human, that sustain us and bring us beauty. 
And I also want to acknowledge the damage that our civilization and culture has done to the land, to the more than human and indeed to the indig indigenous world. The fields are misty as I walk towards the river bank as dawn breaks. Birds are singing in the nearby wooded hillside. And when I reach my spot, that narrow finger of land between the rivers Froome and Avon at their confluence, I pause to take in the light shimmering on the surface and the dark reflections of willow and alder that line the banks. I drop my bag and walking pole and I pause, waiting for the moment to approach. And when the time seems right, I bow, imagining the boundaries of my separate self suffering, softening and flowing out to become part of the wider whole. I introduce myself with my everyday medicine and sacred names, and I call for teaching from the four directions. These ceremonial gestures serve to further separate me from the mundane and open myself to new encounters. And once I feel I've properly arrived, I take out my flask of tea and breakfast cake and offer some to River. As an Australian Aboriginal elder might throw a full, small handful of sand into River to announce themselves as being there with meaningful intent. And then sitting quietly, I try to clear my mind of rambling thoughts and offer River my attentive love. You know, it's up here. Excuse me. It's getting used to all this. In his essay um, in the book, Evening Thoughts, uh, priest, cultural historian, geologian Thomas Berry writes about the problems that are arise from our attachment in the West to a transcendent perspective. And he lists six interpenetrating transcendences, the transcendent mono monotheistic duality, the spiritual nature of the human, the primacy of our belief in redemption or in modern times in progress, the transcendent of mind, a transcendent technology and a transcendent historical destiny. And this attachment to a transcendent view, a view that takes us out of this earthly existence, he argues, has contributed strongly to the anthropocentrism and radical dualism that splits the human from nature, male from female and so on and so forth, and leads to the rapacious, violent and destructive civilization that we've developed and so on to the ecological catastrophe that faces the planet at present. But Berry argues throughout his work that the sacred is not about transcendence. He describes his time as a monk in the Passionist Order, how he came to see the divine office chanting in Latin at daybreak, noon, afternoon, evening and night as a ritual that was part of the, as his words, age-old effort of humans to bring human life into accord with the great liturgy of the cosmos. That the universe was primary liturgy, just as it was primary scripture, I never doubted. And my colleague, philosopher Freya Matthews, Australian philosopher, um, argues more specifically that the whole philosophical perspective of the West is, is uh, rooted in transcendence since the Greeks. It's essentially representational. And again, a quote, it offers a view of the world that being a view is essentially specular in nature. Through the lens of such discourse, we look out onto the world and imagine it spread out passively for our epistemic gaze. We examine it, we survey it, we map it, we reflect on it in an effort to work out how its parts and its aspects all fit together. And we construct an abstract simulacrum uh, that re represents the world in a lens of theory. And throughout this process, the subject remains the active party, that's the thinker. Constructing again uh, an abstract simulacrum in the inner theory of its inner intellect. 
and the world as an abstract construct remains utterly passive, inert, two-dimensional. And so theorizing itself creates the active subject and the passive object. And so Freya writes that from a panpsychic view, which I'll come into later in a minute, the aim is not to theorize the world, but to relate to it, to rejoice in that relationship. And the modern world is, is founded in this dualism, by which I mean not just an identification of difference, but what Val Plumwood, another Australian um, woman thinker, uh, talks about as, as a master-slave relationship, a radical separation between the two poles, probably white male on the one hand and other modes of being. It's an abrogation of all mind to the human, and it's a worldview that's resulted in the kind of disenchantment of the world. Um, and I don't believe we're going to in address the ecological catastrophe with, from within this worldview, and I think other people speaking in this series are going to say the are saying the same thing. Excuse me. So um, another person who's influenced me a lot recently um, is Amitav Ghosh and his extraordinary book, um, The Nutmeg's Curse. If you haven't read this, read it. It'll upset you. He says, this is selected from several pages, the question of who is a brute and who is fully human who makes meaning and who does not lie at the core of the planetary crisis? What if the idea that Earth teems with other beings who act, communicate, tell stories, make meaning is taken seriously? And a bit later, he says, this is the great burden that now rests upon writers, artists, filmmakers and everyone else who's involved in the telling of stories to ask for the task of imaginatively restoring agency and voice to non-humans. And as with all the most important artistic endeavors in human history, this is a task that is once aesthetic and political. And because of the magnitude of the crisis that besets the planet, it's now freighted with the most pressing moral agency. As these events intensify, they add even more greater resonance to indigenous voices Voices that have stubbornly continued to insist in the face of unrelenting apocalyptic violence that humans can, non-humans, can do and must speak. It's essential now, as the prospect of planetary catastrophe comes ever closer, that those non-human voices be restored to our stories. The fate of humans and of all our relatives depends upon this. So in this talk, I want to explore, as the title says, the sacred is imminent in the world, in a world experienced as Gaia, as a living cosmos, and that while that search can be informed by ideas, it's primarily one of experience and practice. So what does it mean to live on Earth as Gaia? That is to say, as a living vital entity in which many kinds of beings create meaning or a communion of subjects rather than a collection of objects, as Thomas Berry puts it. What does it mean not just to think about such a world, but to deeply experience it? And what does this imply for the recovery of the sacred? I just note that, of course, when one's talking about this, there's an implication one knows what one's talking about. Um, and I would like to not claim that, but to share with you some of my explorations, some of my stumbling about in this field. Um, and I'd like just to start off then with a little musical interlude. Um, this is um, this is the piece of wild things that was written a poem by um, Wendell Berry, which I have set to music. When despair for the world grows in me And I wake in the night at the least sound 
In fear of what my life and my children's lives may be I go and lie down where the wood drake Rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who oh, do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel upon me the day blind stars waiting with the light for a time. I rest in the grave of the world and am free so um one of the ways, I just want to say as an aside, one of the ways to address these issues is through, uh, from an animist point of view. Um, Graham Harvey, the uh, professor of divinity, I think he is, talks about a world of people, only some of whom are human. He's quoting an Ojibwa elder there. And the indigenous teachings bring important gifts. And on reflection, it's really disappointing that there isn't a, an indigenous voice in this series. Uh, my, my view is that Westerners, we have to find our own way. Um, when we presented our question, what would it be like to live in a world of sentient beings rather than inert objects, to Anne Perlina, Anne is Professor of Indigenous Studies at Notre Dame in Western Australia, and a traditional custodian of the Maradua, the Lower Fitzroy River in Western Australia. And she responded, well, that's how I live my life all the time. Um, so we need to be careful about how we draw on those. But there is a tradition in the West, a tradition of panpsychism. Uh, it has a long and partly re repressed history in the West, and it's coming back into some sort of fashion. And I'm interested not so much in the analytic panpsychism that is closely associated with consciousness studies, um, but more in what we call living cosmos panpsychism, which is addressing ecological issues and is strongly articulated by Professor Freya Matthews. She points out that the presuppositions and beliefs that we bring to our encounter of the, with the world act as a kind of invocation. They call up reality under particular aspects so that this aspect or that aspect is drawn forth in the course of the encounter. In similar vein, Richard Tarnas, the philosopher at California Institute of Integral Studies, asks us in Cosmos and Psyche to imagine ourselves as the cosmos, not the mechanical cosmos of conventional modern cosmology, but rather a deeply souled, subtly mysterious cosmos of great spiritual beauty and creative intelligence. Would we be more likely to reveal ourselves to those who treat us as a lifeless object plundering our secrets or to those who treat treat us respectfully and maybe lovingly as a living presence i think the answer is pretty obvious freya adopts a radical starting point which draws strongly on spinoza but also on australian aboriginal wisdom she doesn't begin by thinking of a world of inanimate stuff and then wondering where mind might come from she starts from the position that a panpsychic, of a panpsychic perspective, some kind of innerness, and we can call that mood or sentience or subjectivity or the will to self-realization, some kind of innerness is a fundamental aspect of matter, just as matter is a fundamental aspect of that innerness, all the way up and all the way down. 
Freya asks us to consider that the cosmos is one, a coherent field of mind matter, which constitutes a self-realizing and meaning-making system or being that has an interest in its own self-existence and indeed its self-increase in its evolution and self-expression. So meaning is in, the, is in the cosmos right from the beginning because we mean something that is self-aware means something to itself. And this one, this big self, if you like, differentiates into many self-realizing and self-reflexive beings. That's you and me and the mountains and rivers, the oak trees and the mycelium, all glorious yet temporary centers of meaning and action, all of whom return back in time from the one in which they arose. I'm reminded as I speak of Thomas Berry, who said, when I die, where will you be when you die? I'll be back in the cosmos where I always have been. These, these selves, you and me, the oak tree, these can be imagined as ripples or folds in a field-like fabric, forming a dynamic manifold of ever-changing finite modes. Viewed from the outside, these modes appear uh, as the entities described in physics. Viewed from the inside, they constitute a texture of ever-unfolding subjective presence and experience. And these many are in themselves realizing with an interest in their own existence and increase. And so all beings, including the Earth, are integral to the fabric of the living cosmos, all of the same sentient cloth. We humans are part of a world that has depth as well as structure. And out of that, a communicative order, an order of meaning, unfolds alongside the causal material order. The many, us and the others, as a community of subjects, are continually reaching out to each other in mutual contact and communication. It's part of our being to reach out to other beings. Um, humans tend, modern humans, tend to reach out to other humans, but, you know, trees reach out to mycelia and... and so on and so forth. You understand that. This is a poetic ecology, the fundamental erotics of touching and being touched in return. So poetics is not only a way of speaking about the world, it's also communicative engagement with the world. Freya calls this ontopoetics, which is a nice long word, if you like long words. Ontopoetics, the poetics of being. For the expression of meaning doesn't emanate only from the human side. The world is capable. The world actively seeks as part of its self-engagement, uh, engagement with us, not only with us. There's a reciprocal presence, a presence that answers back when our questions send out tentacles of attention in search of it. So as the anthropologist Eduard Viveros de Castro tells us, he observes that once indigenous people open ceremony, other creatures often turn up. And this is also our experience, as we will tell you, I'll tell you shortly. When we invoke a sentient presence, the world may grace us with a response. Of course, this doesn't take place in human language. The world doesn't speak back to us. It's a poetic order conveying meaning in image and metaphor in a language of things, a material language of things. Animals and birds appear, the breeze ruffles of trees, cloud formations change in ways that are synchronous with our invitation. So the world is a place of enchantment, literally meaning. Enchantment literally means wrapped up in chant or song or incantation. Its subjectivity is rendered responsive to human invocation, not determined by human invocation, responsive to because the world responds with its own creative response to our invocation. It's not a question of human construction of an otherwise inert world. The world is a co-creator of its own reality. With beings of limited perception and interest, we see the world through our own cultural and personal constructs. We don't just construct the world, it's not passive. It responds with creative patterns of its own. Now, of course, the trouble is that modern humans are perceptually alienated from this poetic order. If we conceive of a world as brute objects, it can only reveal itself to us as such. If we invoke a living presence, 
then we may receive a meaningful response if we're open to it. And to quote Freya again, to experience ourselves the intimately opposite poetic responsiveness of place or landscape to our communicative overtures is to be shifted in our metaphysical moorings. It is to feel graced, even loved by the world and flooded with gratitude, a loyalty that rearranges the deepest wellsprings of desire. And all this leads to a profoundly significant re-understanding of ethics and morality. In the Western worldview, we have ethical responsibility to other sentient beings, which means humans are to stretch some higher animals. And we are, as uh, Mary Jane pointed out, beginning to extend that. Freya's vision that since there's an informing intelligence in the way things are, we should seek to align ourselves with this intelligence and act in accordance with it, which is what most beings do, as the, some of the Native American teachings say, all beings have a capacity to give away. Humans are the one being, set of beings that have to learn how to do that. So there's an ought at the core of the is, which we need to discover and it shows us how to live. And that ought lies in the fundamental mutuality within the ecology as a whole that ensures the ongoing regeneration of light, life. It's a more ontologically reverent and cosmocentric way of inhabiting the earth. But again, the point is not to understand the world, but to encounter and rejoice in that experience. The challenge of it for a philosopher is not to think about the world, but offer perspectives that enable us to live in the world. Uh, and quoting Aboriginal elders, to know the world, we need to walk the land. And so we, in our way of doing this, we've initiated a series of cooperative inquiries, uh, which I want to tell you about and to tell you some of the stories from that. But I just like to take We've been going for half an hour or so, just under half an hour. Just take a, a couple of questions to see if I'm being clear at this at this point, or there's there's issues that arise about what I'm saying. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, if you want to ask a question, if you can use the raise your hand function, which can be found under reactions at the bottom of your screen, or you can even um, write in the chat. Uh, for me to write out or to read out. Um, we will have the opportunity to have more general discussion later. So yeah. it's more sort of uh, clarifying questions if you have any. If not, I have one for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, in, you've mentioned that, um, you know, nature is responsive to us, as in we need to invite nature to sort of respond to to us. But if nature is um, conscious in the sort of panpsychist approach, why is it passive in that way and not more active? Why, why doesn't nature reach out to us without us necessarily inviting to respond? Why, why doesn't it reach out to us? Yes. Well, I think I thought invitation, I mean. <laughs> I, I think I think the world does reach out to us all the time. Uh, we're just very bad at noticing it. We moderns are very bad at noticing it. Um, and when we do, we we very quickly push it to one side. I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to point out that uh, when Queen Elizabeth died, which whatever you think of the monarchy was quite a, a, a major event that people took notice of around the world. When, when Queen Elizabeth died, a rainbow appeared over Buckingham Palace and Windsor. Mm. Uh, you know, this was noted in the newspapers and, and written off as an interesting coincidence, uh, maybe a little romantically in the worst sense of that term. Um, but from a panpsychic point of view, I might say, hmm, that's curious. That's curious, that's interesting. Does that, does that answer your question? It does, yes, yes. So yeah. basically the answer is, it, it does reach out, we just... It's doing it all the time. It's part of, if we think of the, the, the cosmos, the world, the other beings as always needing other, communication with other for their own self-fulfillment and development, that's, you know, part of a, a relational world. Um, it needs, in order, it, 
in order to do that, we need to be reaching out to each other. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Peter. Yeah, so John's getting he... hand up. Yeah, John has his hand up. Please, John. Thank, thank you very much for what's been delivered so far. Your picture of yourself walking in the misty morning is delightful. For somebody living in rough parts of British cities is not going to be able to do that. What can you say to them? Um, it's much more difficult in, in a city, obviously. Uh, but I'm not trying to argue a political point of view. I'm trying to say this, this, is, this is where we start from. But we all can see the birds, we all can see the, the, the sky, uh, we all can go down to the, you know, in London to the Thames and you walk across one of those bridges and you have this glorious opening of the world. So, um, sure, uh, that is a greater difficulty. Um, and maybe we need to take people out. I have a colleague who, who runs, uh, or used to run, she's moved away now, um, uh, a project for young people in the King's Cross development, the, the Skip Gardens. And she used to take them out into the, out, out camping. And um, so I think there's ways that we need to do this, but um, absolutely right. The world is closed in uh, and we need to be in a very realist, uh, traditional point of view in order to survive. So when I get back in my car, having been down by the river, I can't have that open mentality. I have to drive in a mechanical world, otherwise I run into, <laughs> into other cars. It gets a little dangerous. So it's an, that is a big issue, yeah, sure. Thank you, um, John. Shall I carry on? Um, yes, I don't think I, we have um, any more questions at this moment. So yeah, please. Okay, so when I started talking with the, Freya, amazing what Zoom can do. I mean, I know I have a colleague who I've never actually met in, in physically, but we, we, you know, we have long conversations with that and our other colleagues. Um, I began to see that the work I've been doing all these many, many years with action research, particularly cooperative inquiry, cooperative experiential inquiry, was a way of, of developing this sense of a, a deeper understanding of uh, the panpsychic worldview. There are many ways of doing this. I mean, first of all, she invited me to get so me and some other colleagues to go to Australia and to work with Aboriginal people. And I, I'm afraid I had to say, I don't fly anymore. Uh, the planet can't stand that. So that was not possible for me anyway. Um, and then I realized that, well, there is a whole discipline here in uh, action research that we could draw on. Cooperative inquiry has three central characteristics that make it profoundly suitable for panpsychic inquiry because it treats all those human and by extension other than human, more than human, as subjective self-directing beings and therefore as equal participants in the inquiry process. Uh, it emphasizes the experiential ground of knowing and it asserts the primacy of practice. Now, Cooperative inquiry was clearly developed within a humanistic, humanistic psychology, uh, human oriented uh, context. So in taking it out in this kind of work, we're extending the idea to work with the more than human, uh, specifically to talk with rivers, as I, I will say. Whether we have been successful in drawing them in as full co-participants, I, I don't claim we have, but that is the attitude that we're taking towards this. So in traditional research, the roles of researcher and subject are mutually exclusive. The researcher contributes the thinking that goes into the project, the subjects contribute the action to be studied, and the subjects may know nothing about the questions and the theory and the ideas that the research is actually up to. In cooperative inquiry, these exclusive roles are replaced by mutual relationships. All involved work together, both as co-researchers and co-subjects. Everybody is engaged in the design and management of the inquiry, 
So everybody is talking about the questions that need to be asked and how we'll go about doing it, uh, how we might uh, gather experience, experiential data, so on and so forth. And everybody also gets into the experience and action that's being explored. Everybody's involved in both the making sense and the drawing conclusions. And cooperative inquiry is an iterative process. Participants work together through cycles of action and reflection, developing their understanding and practice by engaging in what we call an extended epistemology. That is ex extended, a way of knowing that's extended from the rational empirical categories of traditional research. And this em em epistemology includes experiential, presentational, propositional and practical forms of knowing, each of which has their own distinct quality. So experiential knowing brings our attention to bear on the life world, on everyday lived experience, or maybe not everyday, but on lived experience. It's this aspect of knowing that arises through face-to-face -face encounter with a person or a place or a thing or a being. Experiential knowing is essentially tacit, almost impossible to put into words. And it's often almost inaccessible to direct conscious awareness. We suddenly may realize something that we've been experiencing, but we haven't noticed, or maybe we've repressed. And it's the touchstone of the inquiry process and deepens as we engage in the cycles. People become more familiar, more able to open themselves to experience. Presentational knowing then can be seen as the first clothing of articulation on that experiential knowing. So I come away from experience, whatever it may be, and I tell a story about it. Uh, one, of my, um, one of my students did research on young women in management and their experiential knowing was deepened by going out noticing that that they were young women in a management field and what that was raising. And then they came, that was the experiential gathering experience, they came back together and told each other stories of what they'd seen, what they'd experienced, what it had been like. So presentational knowing is that's in that story or maybe a sketch we make in the immediacy of putting that first clothing on experience, articulating it for the first time. But also, Presentational knowing can be expanded, it can be artistically developed and created. So it can be developed as creative writing and storytelling and drawing, movement and art, uh, different forms of aesthetic imagery. So it has an extension there of different forms. Propositional knowing then draws on concepts and ideas to make sense of and maybe generate maybe generated from experience. So talking about living cosmos panpsychism, that's propositional knowing at the moment. And it's the link, if you like, between action research and scholarship. But as I've said, propositional knowing of its own always has the danger of separating itself from experience and creating a world that exists in its own conceptual bubble. Often, if one reads academic papers, you, you feel there's some sort of academic discussion going on, which, which really is ungrounded in, in experience uh, in, in, and in practice. But the ability to develop theories critical of everyday common sense grows with an in-depth examination of experience and new narratives. So propositional know is important, but it doesn't need to be separated off. Finally, there's practical knowing, knowing how to, knowing in action. A practical knowing has a, has a quality of its own. It's not about knowing about action, it's knowing in a skill. Useful to the action at the moment of, useful to the actor at the moment of action rather than the disembodied thinker at the moment of reflection. So practical knowing isn't applied science, it's, it's practice. It's being a blacksmith and knowing where to hit the piece of metal. Um, and at the heart of practical knowing is that kind of skillful doing, which may be beyond language, may be beyond conceptual formulation. So these forms of knowing are brought to bear upon each other through inquiry cycles. We go from experience, we tell stories about that, we develop our presentational knowing, we try to 
maybe make some sense of that. Think of it in terms of categories of qualities we're talking about. We then take that back into the world through practice and that gives rise to new experience. And we go through these cycles formally or informally, um, formally or informally, uh, in, a, in a planned, thought out, logical way, which we might describe as Apollonian or in a wild, spontaneous, emotional and um, maybe slightly unhinged way, which we might describe as Dionysian. And that combine again, that reflection of the Apollonian and Dionysian aspects of cooperative inquiry are really important. An inquiry that stays completely logical and stuff like that is, isn't going to really break through into new kind of insights. So a cooperative inquiry can start anywhere in the extended epistemology with new experiences that call for investigation, new practices. Uh, often it starts with questions about practice expressed in propositional form, like the one I'm putting forward. What would it like to be live in a world as a sentient being? Well, how, how would we do that? Um, quality inquiry arises through the systemic and not so systemic cycling through the ways of knowing this. So taking these questions about what is it, what does it really mean? What would it really mean to take this idea of the world responding to us as Westerners? Um, what would it mean to take this seriously? And um, we've initiated a series of cooperative inquiries over the last four years. And the we is myself, uh, initiators, Freya, who, who I've mentioned, Andreas Weber, who is a biologist, German biologist who, who writes and develops the idea of biopoetics. Sandra Wultorten, who is a relational ecologist working uh, with indigenous people and settler communities in Western Australia. And uh, Stefan Harding, who is resident ecologist at Schumacher College. And some of these inquiries have been hosted by Schumacher College. Uh, we originally were going to go down and work with the River Dart, but COVID got in the way. Uh, and so we translated that original idea to an online experience. Um, uh, we've done two with Schumacher College and uh, we got one uh, scheduled for the spring, northern spring of next year. Uh, and we've had two that are independent. Um, most of the Schumacher ones are about seven weeks long, meeting weekly cycles of action and reflection. One of the independent ones is about two years old. The same group of people have been working away at this experience. Um, there's a full account of the first inquiry we do on my website. Uh, it's called Voicing Rivers Through Ontopoetics, a Cooperative Inquiry, um, which is available um, peterreason.net. And why river? Well, it's partly serendipitous. It's partly because we were going to go to Schumacher College and the Dart called us. Partly because each of the principals are working with rivers. Freya has written a, a long account of walking up the Merry Creek in Victoria, for example. And I've been walking down the River Avon for the last couple of years. Stephen Harding's falling in love with a Wren Brook in, runs through his land in Devon, so on and so forth. Um, and it's partly because rivers are interesting complex beings with you know are they a being are they are they a collection of beings it's a really interesting kind of question and they're very available to us in a sense so starting with the assumptions of living cosmos panpsychism we've engaged in cycles of inquiry um, we've invited people to visit the rivers regularly once a week um, to explore different approaches to invocation loving attention, meditation, ceremony, song, gift giving, um, and then to find an initial presentational form in writing or pictures or whatever, and post that account on Google Docs, Google File, whatever it's called. And then we read each other's accounts and we meet together once a week in the small group uh, and talk through what we're hearing. We, draw out each other's experience and then over time we begin to see different kind of interesting questions and categories uh, 
that we we want to understand more deeply and maybe we take those out into the next cycle and do all the same thing together i can talk about all that in more detail if you're interested in in questions later um, my own my own current practice has been to i go down to the river and as i say in that initial account i bow um, i introduce myself i do the little ceremonies and then i sit by the river and I, I don't meditate in the sense of clearing my mind. I, clear, I try to keep my mind empty, but then to notice this and notice that without allowing myself to be caught by any this whirlpool that goes by, this bird call, this, uh, this shadow on the tree, this reflection, just continually moving around. And that seems to be to be... Um, an interesting way of not having too many expectations, but being really open to what happens. We've also done other things, gift giving and so on and so forth. And I can talk about that in more detail if you're interested later. Um, but what I want to do is to tell you a story from early in our the independent inquiry, which all of whom people had done that one of the Schumacher or another piece of panpsychic work. So this is quite an experienced group of people. Right from the start, I'm going to read this because it's it's written as a as a piece of written story. Right from the start, we were brought face to face with the destructive impact of contemporary society on the more than human world. Kathleen, driving on her first encounter with River, which is the French broad in North Carolina, heard a loud crunch and stopping the car, discovered to her horror that she'd run over a turtle, leaving it shattered, but still alive. And she wept over the broken body as she offered it back to River. Surely it was not pure chance that that very same week, Ezekiel came across a turtle by the side of the road in Virginia, killed in the same manner. As they reported their experience back into the group reflection, we were all shocked and reminded of other occasions of violence towards the natural world, remembering and remembering that Turtle Island is the Native American name for the North American continent. Louisa reflected symbolically the whole Western consumerist society is crushing turtles back. The weight is all just too much for the earth. And as we expect as we exchanged these experiences of violence, we wondered how we might have made amends. And there's a whole separate story, which we might come to later in the questions for Kathleen and how she resolved that for herself. But this is my story. So if you can just imagine this first encounter with uh, going out in our cooperative inquiry and this this very confronting um, image of the of the crushed turtle how could we respond and reflecting on my own way forward i remembered ceremonies of prostration that i learned on buddhist retreats i found myself thinking about whether you could include that in a ceremony of offerings to river a full prostration of atonement and i developed all sorts of ways of thinking about this and uh, i realized i was over elaborating it and the way to find out was to actually go and do it. So I visited my own spot, my old spot. This was part of the weekly inquiry process, early one October Sunday morning. I wake at six, dress warmly and make a flask of tea for myself and a box, not a box, a couple of flapjacks. The roads are dark and quiet. Arriving at my usual parking place, I take a few moments to center myself and fully arrive before stepping out of the car. As I pull on my waterproofs, I notice the moon just past full, high and bright in the western sky, shining through a gap in the clouds. A planet and a handful of stars glimmer through the moon's brightness. And looking in the opposite direction toward river, the sky is already brightening, showing just a touch of pink where the sun will soon be arising. The world is almost silent around me as I cross the stone bridge over the River Froome. Just water softly bubbling through the arches, the occasional chirrup of early birds. 
I unlatch the kiss gate into the field and walk across the grass toward river. The pink in the sky has turned to a purple bruise that stretches across the horizon. My moon shadow goes in front of me across the grass. Just being here with the soft light of the moon, the coloured sky, the palpable silence draws me away from everyday distraction into a deeper sense of the presence of the world. And I reach my spot and I start the ceremonial gestures I've described before. Um, and when it's time seems right, I bow and I have this sense of my separate self flowing out to join the wider whole. It's an idea I got from David Hinton and his work on Taoist, um, Taoist bowing and Taoist poetry. And then I wait for the right moment to begin my prostrations. Well, I'm still rather worried about this. The bank is steep and deep and muddy, and even so early in the morning, there'll be dog walkers about. In conventional terms, what I intend to do is quite ridiculous. But the place I'm standing slopes only gently down toward the water, flat and really not too wet for my prostrations. So following my instructions and experience from Buddhist retreats, I introduce myself again and take my next bow down into a full prostration stretched across the grass. And this is what I find myself saying and find myself saying, I'm often surprised with what I find myself saying. River, this is Peter, this is Wolfheart. Thank you for being here. Thank you for always being here. Thank you for being this place that I can come back to. With my friends, with my human friends, we've got more distressed at the damage that we do, this modern society does, that we're part of, complicit with at this moment. And at that moment, an owl calls. I come this morning, the owl calls again. I come this morning to express this sorrow and to prostrate myself to you to show I'm open to your teachings. And a bird calls. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We are sorry. We are sorry. I prostrate myself and ask for teaching, asking how we can make amends, if we can make amends. And I feel my pulse beating on my solar plexus against the cool, damp ground. And then I stand and I see the water's just a little brighter, the purple grooves is extending across the sky, the moon is still bright. The tail lights of a car going up the hill catch my attention, a reminder of the everyday. Yet the owl calling seems to recognise my prayer, drawing me further into the sentient world. And I offer myself again. I bow and prostrate. And now I find myself worrying about whether I'm getting too muddy. And as I stand, I'm filled with conflicting feelings. I'm offering myself through the prostration and I'm self-concerned about getting dirty and I'm worried about whether I can get up and down elegantly at my advanced age and whether I'm being too self-important in thinking that the owl is responding to me and I'm simply reveling in this glorious morning. Let's come out of that. The sky is noticeably lighter. There's just a touch of green on the willow across the water and then there's that owl again. And I wonder how many prostrations I should do. Three in the Buddhist tradition or four for the medicine wheel. I decide that two is quite sufficient for today. And I scramble down the bank to be nearer the river with my flask of tea and piece of flapjack. I offer a little of each to river and settle down to watch and listen. And all the while the sky lightens. The purple fades replaced by pink with a bright low orange low across the horizon. I watch the eddies, the swirling patterns of turbulence that travel downstream to where they meet another line of eddies flowing out from the froom, creating new patterns. And after a while, I ask out loud, what is River's response to my prostration, to my asking how I could make amends? Looking around, I'm struck by the quality of beauty all around me, quite unexpectedly. I feel enveloped in beauty. For a critical moment, a thought crosses my mind. Am I romanticizing? At that very moment, Robin flies across from the willow stump, seeming to contradict the thought. 
I allow myself to sink deeper. What do I experience as I sit here with my cup of tea? I experience the most astounding, very simple beauty. Beauty in the eddies that keep going, always different, always the same. Beauty in Robin's flight. Beauty in the way that little twig just dropped off the willow tree into the water. And then I find myself adding, beauty in the sound of the swan swings that have suddenly come up from behind me. And I'm saying this before I'm consciously aware of that sound. My eyes are drawn upwards to see two swans flying from behind, east across the morning skies. Necks outstretched, wings beating, they fly across the river. Just as I think they're going to fly out of sight, they wheel around and fly right back over my head. And uh, if this works, this is how I experienced it. Beauty in the sound of the swan's wings that suddenly comes from behind me. Two swans flying east across the orange little little morning clouds. And they come round, they fly round. They come back overhead. And the sound fades away. And I'm left sitting with my mouth open somewhat. And then again, the critical voice comes back. Well, this is what happens if you sit quietly in place for a while. And at that moment, the turquoise flash of a kingfisher seems to contradict that thought. And I think, was I pontificating at beauty? Was this romantic bullshit? But more deeply, I know I wasn't pontificating. I was enraptured. I think in the terms that we've used in this talks, this was a non-dual experience. Of simply there and at that moment precisely at that moment the sound of the swans came to my ears and they flew in this great circle over my head and I allow that realization to sink more deeply well so all I can say is oh and I sit in my spot for a while more and my thoughts drift away I find myself thinking about breakfast about the book review I'm writing. Um, I'm not present anymore and I feel, oh my God, I pull myself back feeling guilty. And then I realize it's over, that this moment of astounding beauty and synchronicity has passed. I was here, I saw it, I was it. And now it's time to go home. Every day events press on my awareness, the cows walking across the field, the contrail torn through the sky by a jet, the traffic noise from the road. Full daylight has arrived and it's time to go. But as I return, I remember that resistance, the difficulty of finding the time to come down, of getting out of bed early in the dark, and that extraordinary moment with the moon shadow and the purple sky, which seemed like a threshold into something, some space that was quite different, when the world did seem to be responding to the owl call. And the dramatically changing colours across the sky. And the profound but simple beauty and the swans circling overhead. Um, now, because this, I'm the, the, there's always this danger of talking too much. Uh, I'm really interested in the songs that we can come out of this as forms of presentational knowing. So I'm going to offer you a version of uh, a song of Leonard Cohen's that you'll know very well. Uh, and I th hope you'll be able to see 
um, why I've rewritten it. And meanwhile, we'll just have a few more pictures. Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river You can hear the boats go by You can spend the night beside her And you know that she's half crazy And that's why you want to be there And she feeds you tea and oranges That come all the way from China and just when you mean to tell her that you have no love to give her Then she gets you on her wavelength And she lets the river answer that you've always been her lover And you'll want to travel with her And you'll want to travel blind and you know that she will trust you For you've touched her perfect body With your mind Leonard sang for Susan I sing my song for River For Willow, Herb and Daisy For Alder and Willow For the breezes blowing the treetops and the water gurgling onward And kingfishers bring blessings And swans dance in attendance If you speak to her in person You will find that she will answer She will tell you of her secrets And tell you of her sorrows And you'll find that she's your teacher and you'll want to travel with her And you'll want your eyes wide open As you learn that you can trust her For she's touched your perfect body With her mind Go down to river You need no one to guide you You can watch the water flowing the patterns and the eddies as you clear your mind of chatter and sit quiet with loving kindness you will find that you are welcome that river will embrace you she will show you with her gestures that your place is here beside her and you'll fall in love with earth again Fall in love forever while river holds her mirror. River holds her mirror. River holds her mirror. So this, just to finish, this is my image of the sacred as immanent here on earth in the communion of beings. I'm very taken with Mary Jane's phrase yesterday, being an attendance to earth. It's a lovely way of putting it. And in the inquiry, as we've uh, pursued over these many years, uh, we've increasingly found ourselves, some of us more than others, using language that is traditionally religious for our experience. And this is my, my friend Dave. I think it's everywhere in this inquiry, he says. I think we can come back to the idea that what we're doing is what's always been meant by praying. There's a certain stillness, there's a pilgrimage, a journey, a sense that the sacred is around. That's all this is, this divine signature. 
you know, this whole language is profoundly spiritual, profoundly religion, and prayer is this connection making. And a group of people praying together is worshipping. So I suppose we're trying to invent a kind of liturgy together, a co-creative spiritual, spiritual practice of entering this liminality. And so maybe our moral responsibility um, is to get out there and to help other people get out there, just to think of the question, not because it's good for us, not getting out into nature, but being with the human world as a kind of sacrament and seeking to align ourselves. So that's what I have to say, and I hope that was of interest and that we could have a good discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Peter, for your well presentation, music, stories, images. It was really put together really beautifully. So thank you for that. Um, yes, so let's, um, we've got um, just over um, 50 minutes. Um, so if anyone would like to come in, come in with a question uh, or comment. Um, the only thing I do ask is uh, if you can keep your comments a bit shorter, just out of respect of uh, for the other members of the audience and, of course, the speaker. Um, but if anyone would like to come in. I mean, I've stunned everybody into silence. I think you have, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if, um, I don't know, uh, John, would you have any, any comments, any, anything to say to kick off uh, this Q&A? Yes, well, certainly. Um, when you, <clears throat> uh, that's, that's one of the books that, um, I've had for a long time, and now I'm going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. I I have I've, I've dipped into it because it's so good for. I mean, he's such a good writer. Um, but he's just not available to even well-meaning scientists um you you will know we both know <clears throat> being psychologists that we're in a discipline that is suffers from physics envy it, it just it absolutely uh is or, or has been until recently very uh, wary terrified of the subjective and what you've been telling us about the sort of inquiry you're trying to develop is, is profoundly interesting and sympathetic. I, I am profoundly sympathetic to it. I couldn't sell it to my colleagues under any circumstances. Um, I think this is just me complaining about the rigidity and conservatism of science generally, even the well-meaning scientists, even, the, even, even physicists, um, who recognize how their own inquiry um, inevitably takes them towards um, spiritual issues. Even those will say, yes, uh, well, Peter Reason stuff is sort of jolly entertaining. Um, now let's get back to doing something real. So you, um, have to get, you have to get them to go and sit by the river or toward with a tree or something like that. I mean, yeah, well, lots of luck with that. <laughs> well, let me let me just tell you uh, um, uh, about a bit more about Kathleen, uh, who is um, who is a conservation biologist and she makes her living by doing traditional conservation biologist kind of things in a entirely positivist kind of view. And she's increasingly finding that uh, she doesn't she doesn't like this, it doesn't work, it isn't what she wants to do. So for her PhD, she's taking a year out 
and she's rewilding the land that she lives in in North Carolina and rewilding herself at the same time. Uh, and uh, currently wondering about how she's going to go back to being a conservation biologist. I was just about to say she won't finish her PhD. Oh, she will. <laughs> oh, she will. Um, she's she's a determined woman. Mm. But the the rest of the story, just to give you about the um, the uh, turtle, is that she she goes off to the Turks and Caicos island uh, islands where she has a a, a job to uh, count turtles. And uh, very distressing because there aren't as many around as there ought to be, and it, and it's too hot, and all these kinds of things. And at the end of three long days, they find some nests, turtle nests that have been that the turtles have come out of and gone down into the sea. So they they poke around in these nests to find out you know how many were left and so on and so forth. And they find at the bottom of the second one a baby live turtle that hasn't got out and wouldn't get out unless they had helped it get out. And so they, they, they take it out and they um, they let it run down to the sea a couple of times and, and back so as it gets, what's the, whatever the right word is, it gets placed in the world so as it knows where to come back to if it manages to be a grown up turtle. And then they take it out to sea because if they let it go into the, into the, uh, into the, where, where it would go, they might get eaten by a shark. So they take it out into deep water. So there's a sort of sense of the story comes all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And by the way, I'm not a psychologist. I'm even worse. My first degree was economics. All right. <laughs> so I see we have some other hands up. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, John. Thanks. Next, John. Let's, go to, uh, let's go to Lynn. Hi. Hello. Hello. Oh, there we are. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed this talk. It, it has touched me at every level and um, it felt very holistic to me, which I fully appreciate because some of the talks that get very academic, I have trouble following. I'm taking notes frantically, but it's not always easy to um, stay with the presenter and I felt so much to be with you in this presentation. So thank you for that. I just wanted to share, um, I've taken a year, and this is my 75th year, and so I've taken a year to sort of ask the question of who am I now and how do I, um, how is my being in this world? And one piece of this project, it has a few pieces, has been to go to a native plant garden every week, once a week, and through all the seasons. It started in January when the pond was frozen over. And uh, now, of course, we're in November when all the leaves have fallen. So, as I said, I've done many pieces to this project, and this has been so surprisingly meaningful to me. Um, and I say surprising, I don't even know why I started, I just started. And um, what, there's many parts to it and I won't go into them all, but the thing that has really struck me about just being in one very small little garden is time because I always thought there was spring and then there was summer and there was fall and there was winter. But I see that's not true. It's a constant process. In fact, you can go and see buds forming now as leaves are dropping. Hmm. And so I realized actually the future is, is always setting foot. Hmm. It, and it's made me ponder the whole question of time when I see in that environment, there is no past and future it's all just evolving now it's all now yeah and so it's just been a wonderful experience that i wanted to share with you as part of my gratitude thank you and i think it's really interesting i mean there's some of the people on our inquiries have done very similar there's a, there's one woman probably a bit younger than you who has gone to sit by a pond that was her that was yeah. her piece of water that she worked with yeah. and her stories about what she sees and how she feels, you know, just developing that sense of awareness right. uh, and, and finding out who you are in your 70s. I'm just a shade older than you. I'm beginning to look at 80. Um, 
uh, it's an incensing answer also to, to John's point. If I can't at my age be a crazy old man experimenting with some different things and really pushing the band, then what on earth am I doing? Um, <laughs> so all power to you. I know. Just keep pushing the boundaries. I am. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Um, let's go to uh, Bernard next. Mm. Um, Peter, Hi. thank you. I, 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 also, I also really enjoyed your the two songs. Thank you. And um, and I, I thought your talk also, it, it sort of, um, it followed on so well from the talk we heard yesterday from yes. Mary Jane Rust. Yes. It sort of dovetailed nicely, if that's the, yeah, the appropriate term. Um, I, I was going to make a question, but actually Lynn's remark just has prompted me to say something. I've always been fascinated about time in nature and how it, it seems to operate in different ways for different forms of nature. For example, you look at plants and you think they're sort of inanimate, you know, and they just, because they they, change so slowly compared to us but when you speed up the film of a plant you know you see the tendrils growing and it and, it, and it's just like a living being and of course the same with trees but but it's on a different time scale so it always seems to me that in, in some sense there is consciousness or sacredness if you like which operates on different time scales and that one be, can become aware of that um and we're terribly yeah. caught into our own time scale um, of, of human human time. And that's very interesting, this, this stuff about deep time and how we, we could begin to understand the, the aeons of life on Earth. Um, I think that's, that's another really important thing. And from what I understand, I'm always cautious about saying, well, the Aboriginal people think this, but some link with the Australian Aboriginals, you know, that sense of time always being here and the dreaming is always here. And mm. the child that's born could be your grandfather. There's a sort of this yes. intertwiningness of time. Uh, we, we have a very strange view of time in the West, I think. Yes. Uh, and I confess, I, I'm, I'm somewhat obsessed with the idea of time. And, and it's always seemed to me that we ex we experience time in terms of what I call a specious present, you know, a minimum time of awareness, which for humans is something like a second or a tenth of a second. So we, that's discrete chunks of experience in some sense. But it's clear that one different, there could be different forms of consciousness, if you like, or different forms of life, which have very, very different yeah. times of specious present. So when you talk about um, speeding up the film of, of a plant growing or the trees or, or the fungi growing, that's because their, their species presence is much longer. And, and then when you look at different forms of nature, animal, you know, the species present for a fly is much shorter. So that, you know, when you try and swat the fly, um, you can never do it because it's got a shorter species presence. So it just sort of carries on smoking its cigarette before gently, you know, flying away and getting swiped by the newspaper. On the other hand, we know there are some forms of life which seem to have a much longer species present. So I, I just think it's fascinating, the whole idea of that hierarchy of species present, which arises in, in nature and, and having respect for that and even experiencing it in, in well, in, in different states of consciousness, I guess. Um, there's, a lovely, there's a lovely story which I'm trying to remember the man's name, an Icelandic journalist who who um, who wrote the blessing on the first glacier that has disappeared in, in Iceland. I can't remember his name, but it's a book. Uh, and he talks about being in his grandmother's kitchen. So he's a middle aged man. So his grandmother's quite elderly, being in his grandmother's kitchen with his daughter. And he says, yeah. daughter's about eight. Do you know this story? And he says, can you count? all the time since your grandmother was born. So she must have been, you know, it's 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 sort of a hundred and something. It's, so your great grandmother was born, it's sort of 90 years. And then imagine her with her great grandmother uh, and then think forward to your great granddaughter who you might hold on your lap. The number of people who will have who have touched you who will have touched others that you know is something like 290 years 
yes that's yes. the expand if you're lucky a familial uh, i worked mine was about about 272 it's quite amazing to think in those terms those are the people that that are actually in touch with each other over generations oh yes it's fascinating i remember attending somebody's 90th birthday and he gave a speech where he said he could remember when he was a young fellow at trinity hearing someone giving his 90th birthday speech and he said he could remember when he was a young fellow they were discussing the, the outcome of the battle of the waterloo yes Exactly. But anyway, but I'm sorry, I'm, this wasn't the question I was originally going to ask, but I was inspired by, uh, by, by Lynn's remark. So right. my well, question was very different, actually. And, and it was, and, um, it, you know, you refer to this story of, Ka of Kathleen who run over the turtle and heard the crunch. And for some reason, that story <laughs> stuck with me. And, um, and because I, I guess, you know, one has similar experiences all the time. You know, you drive on, you drive down the motorway and you've got these hundreds of flies which have splattered across your windscreen and things like that. But I just wanted to ask, how does one distinguish between, in some sense, necessary and unnecessary destruction of nature? Because we know that it's part of nature that a certain fraction of, of life is always going to be, you know, not survive. I mean, we know with turtles, I mean, you, you, you gave a follow-up example. I remember watching one of these David Attenborough programs about these turtles and how only some small fraction of them actually survive because they, they crawl out of their holes, but many of them get lost or go the wrong direction or cross the road and get run over. So it's clearly part of nature that there is death and destruction. It's not part of nature for one species to be blundering around in large pieces of metal, uh, not really looking at what they're doing. Um, oh, yes, yes. Well, that's, I mean, that's what I, the point, and it well, may be even well, intentionally chucking high explosives around and not being paying attention. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but I was, at, at, but on the other, I was contrasting the situation where one is in some sense, unwittingly perhaps, playing a role in nature's the necessary process of nature where only a certain fraction of species any species is going to survive and how you then you contrast that with the 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 once an unnecessary destruction which we for example as human beings are you know inflicting upon the planet and yet how do you how does one know what is necessary and what is not necessary i mean it's clear that when we're destroying the planet that's unnecessary but i just feel there must be sort of gray areas where you can't quite decide what is yeah. part of nature and what is 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 wanton destruction yes and i think that's where this notion of aligning ourselves and really studying the ecological consequences but we don't even begin to do that most of the time mm. and and also um, asking permission you know, um, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book that Mary Jane referred to, always about talking to the plants, asking permission. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get permission, don't dig it up. You know, that whole sense of, of not seeing ourselves as being in control and making those decisions, but yeah. consulting the world as we go along. Sounds a little balmy to a Westerner, but, but that's what we've got to move ourselves into. But I mean, for example, I'm not a vegetarian. Maybe I should be, but but I mean, in a sense, every time I I eat a, a chicken, I, I, I suppose I'm just as guilty as the person, the Kathleen who run over the the, the turtle. I mean, so yes. I, how does one does one just apologise or, or thank the chicken? I'd... I think that's a good start. But we start thinking about the question, mm -hmm. not rushing too close to the answer. Mm. Anyway, thank you, Peter. I'm yeah. talking too much, so I should stop now. But... I see somebody has put in the chat the name of the book that I was trying to refer to, On Time and Water by Andre Snyder Magnusson. An interesting book. Yes, so we have... Yeah, yes, we'll have uh, Marie France uh, next. Oh, I can't spotlight. Oh, there we go. Hi. First of all, I, I want to thank you for not only the content, but the form of your presentation. Uh, it was ve I was very moved. I was deeply moved. And what I uh, wanted to um, add is that uh, once this 
sensitivity to beauty, uh, to life, to Gaia is awakened. Um, it stays with you. I mean, I live in a city and I choose not to have a car. So, and, 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 um, have had uh, to spend time at home for quite a while. And yet uh, to, to sort of uh, answer the person who was wondering about uh, what do you do if you don't have contact with nature? Um, the, you, can, you can adapt a tree on your street. I mean, you know, literally, uh, you can be aware of uh, the quality of the lighting in your apartment. Uh, it's like a, a holographic experience in terms that no matter where you're coming into, uh, it opens up to, to, to the whole sacredness. You can be washing your floor and, and be in resonance with the, the void that you share between your atoms and its atoms. Um, yes, as, as Thich Nhat Hanh says, it's washing up, washing up with the discipline, doing the dishes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So any experience, once you, you awaken that uh, filter, yeah. Or rather, when when you diminish all the other fiddle filters, is is probably more likely. But that that poetic way of uh, relating to the fact that you are alive in a living uh, planet, yeah. um, it almost doesn't matter where you are. Though, of course, there are sublime experiences in nature, mm -hmm. and to be there and and to express and share your 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 um, gratefulness uh, gratitude uh with it is uh i think something that we will all benefit doing and the the, the gaia will also benefit uh doing That's so right. anyway thank, thank you. you very much thank you thank you thank you Thank you, uh, Mary France, for your uh, comment. Uh, next, we'll go. We'll go to Todd. Okay. Hi. Well, thank you. Good to see you all, and uh, thank you for your very personal meditations, Peter. I think each of us, when we have profound interactions with nature, they are profoundly personal. Um, in my particular world, I sort of have an outsized presence of nature, so I consider myself exceedingly fortunate to have many a moment to immerse. But what I want to offer, not as a question, but as a very recent uh, observation and experience, is I showed up tardy today because I was just driving in from a historical conference this of uh, Friday and Saturday, on Friday of which I presented. And again, this is a historical conference, an academic historical conference. But in that moment, one doesn't consider professional historians and amateur historians to have a particular spiritual outlook or bent. But the other young woman that was part of my section she actually mentioned deep time a couple of times in her presentation. And that's to me, to my previous experience, you know, unheard of. And then even more profound, this is just last evening during the keynote speaker at a banquet. This was a youngest gentleman, probably in his mid to late forties, but his concept, what his, his, speech, his talk was about was about the artificial nature of the political boundaries that we've established in the last few hundred years. And that history is now starting to look at it as far as ecosystems and cross-border things. And he, again, used the term deep time more than once. There was mm. a very spiritual nature to his, his premise. And that, to me, is a, a profoundly positive data point. This is in an, another area of academia, but there's a recognition, and some of it's generationally based, as a more holistic approach to these things. And yeah. so after his particular talk, you know, I, we exchanged emails, can, and I had a, a knowing conversation about deep time and we have not yet continued that conversation because this is just but 12 hours ago. But I look forward to further understanding how he understands history in a very new way. And that's again, a discipline that doesn't do that. The historian, I'm trying to remember his name, Chakrabarti, uh, talks about the Anthropocene being the time when human history and natural history come together and, and in a sense collide. 
Um, and I notice in in uh, just before we started, I was looking at um, the latest issue of the mag the journal World Views, and there's a thing there if you're interested in history and deep time, an article, which might be of interest given your historical interest. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you Todd. It's good to see you. Um, next, let's go to Kathleen. Hi. You're muted. Thank you, James. I didn't expect you to call on me so quickly. Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment, Peter. First, thank you. And I was um, very interested in what you were talking about with respect to the inquiry exploration, that context. And the reason I am very interested in that is because I've myself witnessed the power of that. So I'm an organizational development consultant, and we have done a complete series. We call it the Leadership Conversation Series, which is given by my, my own design work in uh, quintessential youth design. But that's not the important part. What's important is that every time we meet, um, leaders are left in an inquiry to go out to their work, to their life. So we call it life and leadership. And, the, and then they come back and they update uh, in person what they've seen without interruption. Um, so everyone listens and then comments and et cetera. It is an amazingly, it has changed the way that leaders lead because what they are seeing as they're doing this is who the elements of who, who they are and what makes them who they are. And so to Marie France's point, it is everywhere. It's, it's not just in nature, it is, uh, it is the aliveness of seeing that in your colleague, in your, uh, in your team, in your work. I mean, this, this notion of inquiry, exploration, discovery has been extremely powerful. And uh, we piloted it in 2018 and we cannot keep up with people coming to, to do the work. Um, it is, and it, it, because it is both individual and collective, it, we, even in conversation as they update, people see something about themselves. And hence, as they see about themselves, they, those subtle shifts occur and the subtle relationships grow. So I just wanted to say that. that well, it's, it, 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 it's really interesting to hear that um, because this kind of work, I mean, my talk about cooperative inquiry, but this kind of work, you're talking about organizations, but you know, I, I, I was privileged to go to Bangladesh and to be taken out to many villages where they were doing action, participatory action research projects. Yeah. And uh, to see the, the problems they were solving, like solving real nitty gritty problems of farming relationships and who owns what field, but also about how they dealt with authorities. And, you know, I remember memorable one man saying, it's only through doing this work that I realized I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. with so it is a very moving process. Um, I, 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 um, I was very involved with it for many years academically and supervising research students doing work into their own lives and practices. And then I, I um, when I retired from academia, I thought, well, I've done enough of that. I <laughs> want to do something else. And it's really interesting that this work with, um, with panpsychic experience has drawn me back into that work. Yes. With a different dimension. I'm very grateful to that. I'm very grateful yes. to see that. Really. Yes, and and it it works always both individually and collectively. Like we work into with individuals that way, and also in groups. So just yeah, it's it's okay. very very powerful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you um, so much, Kathleen. Um, I don't see any questions up for now. Um, James, can... Belgene has her hand up. Oh, yes, Belgene. Sorry, I didn't see you. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this. It brought me back to my childhood, lying on the grass by a river. And uh, to do it as an adult, um, try it in the summertime, I guess, better than in the mud or the cool weather that you described. But thank you very much for this. I was thinking also of the many cultures that right from the very beginning, 5,000 years ago, the Egyptians wrote about the Nile River as a life-giving source. And mm. 
It has remained so up until the present, although uh, in a much uh, less significant way. And um, I just uh, en enjoyed listening to you very much and uh, realized uh, how disturbed I am when I hear that the Po River dried up in certain places yeah. in the summer. Uh, the mighty Rhone River starts here in Switzerland with three small confluences and uh, is, uh, is a very interesting river also and mm -hmm. has interacted in, in many ways, not only personally with people enjoying being at the river, but in terms of the industry along it and that. But I think this um, brings it, uh, your, your talk brings it to, down to a much more personal level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, don't be too worried about the summer. I mean, I know we have to be careful and keep warm, but um, my experience of going out in the winter and going out while it's still really dark and, and seeing the dawn come up, I actually find I prefer that. I find myself frustrated in England in the summer when I can't get out while it's still dark because it's, you know, it's still, yeah. it, it wakes up at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, well, you're, you're being touched by another sensation, perhaps, of the cold and it's a more, more sensate experience also. Wonderful, wonderful darkness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jean. Um, let's, uh, let's return to John. I can see your hand up. Very quickly, at one point, Peter said to the river, you will always be here, or words to that effect. Well, it won't. No. And I don't mean that it might dry up like the Po. I mean that at some point it wasn't anywhere, and at some point in the future again it will be nowhere because things change on the scale of deep time. Yeah. And so this, this is a question. I, I have I've enjoyed what you've said enormously, and uh, I, I, I feel I agree or uh, I'm in some sort of sympathy with it. But isn't it still anthropocentric? It, it, it somehow places us at the center of things. And I take on board very much your point about there not being an indigenous perspective in this series, and that's quite right. But in other worldviews, we're not so important. I think the challenge of, of anthropocentrism is, is really is really important and really interesting to talk about. But there's something about that whole idea of anthropomorphism or anthropocentric, which is itself anthropocentric. You know, like we, we think of our, we think we mustn't think of the world in, her, in human terms. We mustn't anthropomorphize because that will make it seem bigger. It's from an assumption that we are something special that we do that. Um, to go down to the river and open oneself to whatever it has to teach to go down to the river and demand a response is is clearly anthropocentric and and egoic but to go down and open one's heart and mind to what it might be able to teach seems to me to be seems to me to be different it is to place oneself back or to attempt to place oneself back into the community of beings um, and of course the river won't always be there and so of course it's anthropocentric but one of the interesting things about the panpsychic view is that it's different from that sort of constructivist view that we're used to in psychology, because the constructivist view says we see the world through our own lenses. But the, and the, the panpsychic world agrees with it. Yeah, we have our own cultural biases and stuff like that. And so that's why we talk about burning bushes or the Red Sea or whatever we talk about. But the world responds to us, this creative cosmos responds to us with its own creativity. So it isn't just a question of us projecting onto the world, it's a question of the world somehow, in its mysterious way, showing us something which wasn't, wasn't what we expected. So that's what one's trying to open oneself to, is an interaction like you and I are interacting here, 
and it's, it's a difference it's different but it is that subject to subject interaction and that's what one's trying to open oneself of course the river won't always be here and in saying that in that prayer i did spontaneously yeah and i also worry you know that all this business about the beauty of the river and all the kingfishers and like that they're all full of shit in this country as well and they're being dammed up and you know the river in bath ran dry um because one of the weirs burst you know the river isn't a, a natural object it's it's a um hybrid in bruno latour's terms but there's still some essence of something there um which one can open oneself to and it's all very mysterious and as soon as you start to talk about it in too much detail you start to go up your own backside that's why i think the stories are so important because i didn't expect those swans to come i didn't expect you know we don't expect these things they happen there's another story i've just people like seem to like the story so i'll offer you another one ezekiel who is one in one of our inquiry groups lives in um I think somewhere in virginia and he was out running or walking and he came across a hemlock grove um which he knew very well and the hemlocks are being attacked by some as many trees are by some parasite and there's this big tree that he's known for a while and, and loved and respected for a while which had fallen and so it had created a an opening in the forest which of course is a natural process but he sat down on this tree and wept because he had formed a close association with it and as he sat on the tree uh, for quite a long time and he looked up at the circle of sky above his head and there were crows a group of crows going round and round and round and round and round and it felt to him like a sort of a natural ceremony that had occurred without him inviting it it was something that had happened spontaneously for some reason that responds to that idea it's not necessarily anthropocentric the world is doing these things and once we begin to notice them they're there more and more i believe <clears throat> we have more hands <laughs> getting to the end of my glass of water um i'd like to invite uh beth um was having issues putting up her hand but please yeah thank you um peter i wish i had met you 30 years ago <laughs> i i as well was trained in organizations and and worked with action research and one of the experiences really came to my mind as i was listening to you uh I was fortunate to be in a big corporate situation for a while in which uh, I was allowed to arrange development activities for leaders in which I could take them to natural settings and have them have a different kind of experience of the world, but also what their leadership might mean to it. So it's very much taking your your sense of action research uh, into a setting where you wouldn't think it would be very acceptable. And I saw people be so deeply, deeply touched by those kinds of experiences. But the thing I wanted to, to ask your thinking about, uh, I, you know, I was fortunate because I was in an environment where I was allowed to do that. But the thing that I really saw was the deep hunger that people have, you know, and we like to damn the corporate officers and the, the leadership for what's happening. But there's this other side that is this deep longing, this deep um, dismay, where they have the longings, but they don't seem to have the resource they don't have the understandings of how to enact this in a way that makes a difference now maybe that sounds foolish but particularly when we would have really young people you know the kids not so far out of college maybe the late 20s or so they are so they've been so brought up with their cell phones that they can't think about nature they can't even think about how to relate well but the, but 
the longing is still so prevalent with them that they need people like what you're doing to somehow be able to to find them. Um, so on one hand, it feels so desperate at times that we're doing the wrong things, but it's as if the world needs more people such as you taking the opportunity to make this action research available. And I'm just curious what you think about that. Is that what you've been finding as well as there is a deep longing as well as all the aggravation that we see and all the destruction? And, and is there a way that people who have some wisdom like this can more make it available to this sense of longing? Yeah, so of course it's really interesting because there's a there's a potential instrumentality. We're going to go out into nature and we're going to learn how to be better humans. It's like we're going to go out into nature because it's good for our heartbeats or something like that. That's that's probably true, but that's not what you're talking about. It's not what I'm talking about. We we um I think you're right. Um we we did at the University of Bath with my colleague Judy Marshall and, and Jill Coleman, we initiated a Masters in Responsibility and Business Practice, which was this was in 90, 1995, we started and it was way ahead of its time, or it still would be way ahead of its time and it hasn't saved the world as we expected it to, but never mind. Part of what we did then was to take everybody down to Schumacher College and we worked with Stefan Harding and he did sessions in the morning about deep ecology and about Gaia theory. And every afternoon we designed some kind of exercise, <coughs> excuse me, going out into the world, uh, walking down the River Dart in sort of the last bit of wilderness you could find around a you know, real true wilderness because it's right next to the river. And yes, people uh, remembered earlier experiences, they remembered childhood experiences, they had some, I think, very profound sense of, of um, being in a different kind of a world. How you how you take that back into the everyday life? I I simply don't know, um, but yes, the, I think there is that longing. And again, the um, the experience of the of the um, uh, the Skip Gardens, uh, um, the Global Generation, uh, as a as a website called Global Generation, you can see what they're up to. They're working with young people, not and the the argument is we're just not teaching them to grow. Uh, vegetables in skips in this developing area around King's Cross were also helping them to see that they are part of a wider whole. So they have this I, we, the planet kind of kind of thing. So I think there are also, well, I think this is what Mary Jane was saying yesterday. There are all these interesting and hopeful signs. Um, and yet the world keeps crashing back in with its with its uh, mechanical thing. And we just all have to, I suppose, do our, keep doing our bit. I'm not sure what else to say about it, but I'm really delighted that you had those kinds of experiences. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Beth, for your question. Um, we have a few hands up. Let's go to uh, Max next. Just mute her at the moment. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, uh, good. Yes. Well, I, you know, I really uh, in, in enjoyed your presentation and the, and the openness and sharing and, and, and all of that and resonate with so much. And I know I'm not alone in this crowd. So I'll, I'll try to be specific. You, in your talk about ways of knowing and talking about the process you've been engaged in, and you talked about action and reflection, and it made me think of Paulo Freire and pedagogy of the oppressed and the, the, those the, the necessaries for transformation as opposed to reformation or confirmation and I see you nodding so I'm just uh, asking you to, to talk about that a little bit yeah it's really interesting I mean this is this is old expertise I'm not up to date with action research but it has many roots <clears throat> I mean some of the roots were in my roots were in humanistic psychology some of them were in organization development. Um, some were in the development field and and education. I mean, Paolo Freire is clearly one of the one of the founding persons of that sort of education. Um, 
it was very interesting when I started to to get into the field as an academic. Um, it was it was in a sense very fragmented that the organization development people didn't talk to the humanistic psychologists and we certainly didn't know much about what the was going in the majority world and and so on and and so forth and um several of us were working to draw that together there was a colombian action researcher who's no longer with us orlando Fals border who started what he called the South-North Dialogue. It was very important that it was the South-North Dialogue, not the North-South Dialogue, and, and was quite successful in getting us to talk to each other about these different kinds of things. But there are so many sources of it. I mean, liberation theology is another one. They're, these are all different aspects of um, learning from experience which have more or less radical roots. Um, it was a huge privilege to be working in that field um, for, for so many years that I did. Yes, Palo Fres is really important. Um, we, we must, we must give, we must learn. Uh, what is the quote I love so much? We, we must give back to the people what we've learned from the people as a problem so that it can be transformed. That whole process of listening, giving back, and then it can, then it is a problem rather than a oppression turning prop that whole notion of problematizing yes wonderful wonderful i was given that book in something like 1975 i think with the inscription this is the height of liberationist thought <laughs> there's a wonderful yeah. place in uh, the highlander center in in um in Tennessee. Do you know the Highlander Center? That's where they, they did a lot of this participatory research in, in, uh, in America. And um, Paolo Ferrer came to visit and um, they, 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 they did an interview book. And um, some of the really key people, including Rosa Parks in the civil rights movement, were influenced by the Highlander Center. When I went there, I was very privileged to go see there. And we went into this you know, it's a typical, rather uh, southern building, and the big meeting hall is, um, it's not rows of chairs and stuff like that with a projector, it's a circle of rocking chairs. And so something really profound about the sort of democratic, relaxed nature of the conversation. Beautiful place. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Max, for coming in. Uh, finally, let's take the uh, last question from James. Uh, hello there. Yes, you mentioned something called ontopoetic. So I wondered if you could possibly elaborate on that, please. Well, ontopoetics is 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 this um, um, some of what I, I I said. Ontopoetics is the idea that a, as we call to the cosmos it responds to us, that it is also making meaning or the different beings are making meaning. And, the, and so it's not just us projecting our thoughts or desires or our constructs onto the, onto the cosmos, but it, the cosmos, the beings are responding in their own right, in their own creative way. So the meaning making comes from both sides. And it's poetic because um, it's, it's, it, is rep, it is not representational language, it's not specular language, it's, it's always expressed in metaphor. So, you know, we can't say what those swans were meaning as they came overhead, but there is, there is some sense of meaning that we can explore in that. So that's, does that, there's an article on, on, if you really want to know more, there's an article on Freya's Matthew's website called An Invitation to Ontopoetics. Um, which says more about that, but it's an attempt right. to. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. I, the, the other question I was going to ask is: Is there a particular book of hers that you recommend? Because I was very interested in what you were saying about her work. Um, I'm particularly interested in taking panpsychic worldviews and and how you can make that, how you can relate that to lived experience, particularly in terms of ritualistic. Um, um approaches to nature um right. i assume she talks about that yeah. um well this this is one 
um, book. Oh, I, I can't see it actually. Well, it's quite, <laughs> all I've seen is very, very easy cover. It's called For Love of Matter. Love of Matter, okay. For Love of so, Matter. And yeah. that is, it starts off quite poetically. And then it goes into quite, a, quite I have to say, quite a heavy explanation of panpsychism. Yeah, there that's are, great. I'm into that. It's a good philosophical argument, but there are more up-to-date papers that I'm not sure if they're available uh, easily. Um, there's, um, there's, there's a really, if you've got a university library, uh, there's a really interesting conversation around panpsychism and and um and re different religions there's a conversation between the panpsychic experience the traditional judaic experience christian hindu Tao, uh, all people from that contributing from to this book and freya's introduction there is is very good i can't give you the reference offhand but um if you have it if you can get that the other one, there is an introduction in the Handbook of Panpsychism. There's an introduction by Freya Matthews to her point of view about, and it's really important to differentiate Freya's point of view, which is an environmental panpsychism, starting from the cosmos and working down, from the kind of panpsychism that's being argued, as I said, around um, uh, consciousness studies. Uh, which is my, I, my view is much more limited. Um, there's the book by um, Galileo's Error. What's it called? Uh, what's the name of the? I've forgotten. I'm getting too old. It's, by, it's by Philip Goff. By it's Philip called, Goff, yes. Just called Galileo's Error. Yeah, that's a good. That's a really clear, interesting book to read. Um, but it has quite a different uh, emphasis from 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 players. So that's all worth getting into. I mean, Goff talks yes. in, in his final thing about what would it be like if we, if we really took for granted, you took really that the forest is teeming with life and consciousness, but then he doesn't do anything with that. Um, uh, so there's a there's a disappointment in in there, but it's a really nicely argued book from from a scientific point of view. That's great. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Thank you, James. And it's so good. Get in touch if there's anything else. I've got lots of Freya stuff, as you could imagine, because uh, we're working very closely together. She's actually putting together a um, collection of her papers. That's not going to be out for a little while, but I know that's happening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, so we've you. got just about two minutes left so I guess we should sort of um, start bringing this session to a close. Um, Peter I'd like to bring it back to you and see if there's anything you would like to leave us to, uh, to finish the session. I, I think I've said enough. <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> think of anything else to say. Um, uh, yeah I mean well I'll say again do a bit of publicity. We're doing another Living Waters course uh with schumacher college this will be a cooperative inquiry into rivers it'll be on zoom uh, it will be uh, truly international we, we hope to have people from australia and north america as well as europe uh they've been very successful so far so uh, i'll just do a little end with a little publicity of course, of course. <laughs> well thank you i want to say thank you all for listening and thank you for your questions and i hope this has been stimulating I mean, it definitely has on my side and just seeing the comments that came in the chat after you concluded your presentation, they were just beautiful. I mean, deeply moving, beautiful, sacred. So you've, I think you've uh, increased the audience there. So really, thank you for that. Um, and of course, thank you for everyone for joining us today and contributing in the chat or with your questions. Um, just before we go, I'd just like to uh, invite you all to uh, next week's sessions of uh, Recovering the Sacred. On uh, Saturday 19th, we will have Bernard Carr, uh, who we've met during the session, and uh, Alex Gomez Marine uh, talking about towards a transmaterialist science of the sacred. And uh, on Sunday the 20th, we will have Anne Baring uh, talking to us about the loss and recovery of the sacred. So I hope you can make it to the um, live events then otherwise of course the uh, recording is available um in the meantime though you can contact us on our website or via email eleanor at is the uh, best email to use 
until then, thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Peter. We'll see you again soon here at the Fire Center. Bye.